on today's show, the Player Capsule Series continues with a two-part breakdown of John Collins. And also, we touch on the DeJounte Murray. I will call it a non-rumor on this podcast. We'll get into all of that and more coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1491 of the Lawton Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Monday evening into Tuesday. And today's show is brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook, which is a sportsbook on the Lawton Podcast Network. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on right now to get started. And I also want to take the top of the podcast, make us your first listen here at Lawton Hawks each and every day. Check us out anywhere you get your podcasts, places like Apple and Spotify and YouTube. And we really, really do appreciate you listening to the podcast. As I said in the tease, it's going to be a two-part episode this time around. First, uh, I'll touch on something else, but uh, then it will be myself and Glenn Willis talking about John Collins across two parts. Uh, we talked about John for a while, and actually the next two of these player capsules on Collins and then DeJounte Murray will be the next one up later on in the offseason. They're both uh, a little bit longer, so we cut, we chopped them down into uh, two shorter episodes. But first, there was a little bit of a rumbling that I was asked about a lot, so I'm going to touch on that at the top of the podcast. It comes from Eric Pincus of Bleacher Report. A few days ago, he wrote the following in a piece that was not focused on the Hawks overall, but had some Hawks stuff in it. I'm going to read you the uh, the portion I've been asked about quite a bit in the last few days. And I quote, The team is believed to be looking for a home for John Collins, but some whispers abound that, that, that DeJounte Murray could be had in the right deal. Murray is due $18.2 million this season and may not, may not be open to an extension, limited to a $25.4 million starting salary. Unless Atlanta can shed significant salary elsewhere, they may not be able to afford Murray at his current price, let alone on a new deal in the like, likely asking range above $30 million. End quote. So uh, this got poorly aggregated in some places. This is not Eric Pincus's fault. He wrote what he wrote, and I'm going to sort of interpret that exactly. But this is not a trade rumor. I'll be honest about that. I know this has been sort of a theme the last couple of weeks and months about what is and what is not a rumor, but this is not a rumor or anything close to it. Um, first part, quote, some whispers abound. That's not really a reporting anything. Even if it was, the next part of, and I quote again, could be had in the right deal, end quote, is very soft language. The only, part, only player on the Hawks roster that I would not throw in the, quote, could be had in the right deal category is Trey Young. There's a big gap between the Hawks actively shopping DeJounte Murray and even taking calls on DeJounte Murray and an external belief that he, quote, quote, could be had in a deal. So, yeah, it would not shock me if, honestly, like it would with Trey. I think Trey's the only one that would actually shock me if the Hawks really actively shopped a player without um, him actually asking to be out. Um, so, yeah, if they traded Murray this summer, I wouldn't fall on the floor by any means. And I could make an argument, honestly, that they should at least consider it. That's not being reported here, though, by Eric Pincus. It's not what he's putting out there. There is no rumor. And the only thing here is kind of another reminder that the Hawks and Murray are in a difficult spot. I talk about this a lot on the upcoming player capsule with DeJounte. But he is entering this, se- this season on an expiring contract. And they are very likely to extend that deal because the Hawks just simply are not allowed to, under the CBA, offer him enough money to entice DeJounte to, to sign it. Maybe I'll be surprised. And basically the whole league agrees on the fact that Murray's not going to take this deal so maybe there'll be a curveball and they'll find an agreement. But in the meantime, uh, that's kind of a weird situation that they're in going into expired contracts. But this is not a rumor. They're not shopping him. At least, at least not, that's not been reported at this point in time. So keep that in mind as you're sort of wading through the waters here in the offseason. And again, speaking of Murray, a two-part capsule on the way with Glenn. That's also the case today with John Collins. Uh, just, uh, just for the back, for background here, Glenn and I have been talking about these player capsules for quite some time. We did all of the bench pieces already. Sadiq Bay, Jalen Johnson, AJ Griffin, Bogdan Bogdanovic, et cetera. And uh, we went a little bit longer on these two. And I know that I will get yelled at by the network if I don't chop them up into two parts. They're trying to get me to go a little bit shorter on some of these. So I understand that. And uh, that's going to be uh, that's kind of the reason why. If you're wondering why this episode is going to be chopped up, that's part of the reason. So you listen to part one right now. Part two available right now as well in your podcast feeds. Whenever you listen to this podcast, by the time you are done listening to it, part two should be available for you in the same spot. I've been talking also about the draft. Where the draft is coming fast and furious. In fact, the draft is about a week and a half away as I record this podcast. Next Thursday um, is the draft. I've already done some recent episodes with Richard Stamen and Ben Pfeiffer. I did Brian Schroeder on the podcast previously. All kinds of draft content, and we'll have more of that coming up. In fact, I have a couple guests lined up already. I will not 
hopefully jinx them by saying that on the podcast. But hopefully next couple of days, we'll have some more draft content in this space. I'll have my own solo thoughts as well as the draft arrives. And inevitably, the mock draft stuff will heat up. Might have a rumor or two to th- touch on between now and next Thursday. So plenty of time and plenty of effort put into this draft process. I love the draft. We'll talk about that a lot coming up. But uh, we're still in the player capsule series for today. So two-part episode, myself and Glenn Willis, part one right now, part two available when you're done with this. And without any further delay, here is myself and Glenn talking about John Collins. I am joined again by my friend Glenn Willis to continue our player capsule series. Glenn, how are you? Yeah, good. Feels like it's been forever since we've done one of these for some reason. <laughs> it it has. Uh, we we've been busy. You've been busy. I've been busy. Uh, NBA Finals happening. Draft is on the way. Uh, and as always with these, um, I pretty much never post these the day that we record them because they kind of stack up, which is on purpose. It's the off season. Gives us some flexibility, but uh, an interesting one today. Uh, as people are listening to this, our most our most recent one that we posted was uh, we had we had DeAndre Hunter, and then we had Clint Capella. Uh, John Collins is up next, and uh, we were talking about this before we started recording. Uh, we agreed that Hunter was probably the most difficult one of these in some respects, as from a nuanced perspective. Collins is probably next on the list. I think we agree with that. Uh, maybe even uh, number one for some people. Uh, this is a, yeah. we, we both like John Collins. I uh, will say that for any, any new listeners, I think Glenn and I probably are a little bit higher on John than the consensus right now. Uh, but uh, did you find this difficult? Because it kind of was for me. Uh, I mean, it's it's a difficult conversation when you think about trying to expand it to the conversation that might be in reaction to kind of what we talked about today. The difference between Collins and Hunter for me is that the Collins noise has been out there, I think, longer, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and so it's kind of, I don't know if it's died down um, or it's just kind of become part of the normal noise uh, kind of around talks conversation and things like that. Where it seems like this past season, the Hunter is issues that a lot of the fans had with Hunter kind of really built an apex, like towards the end of, end of the season. And so, um, you know, hard to kind of uh, compare long standing noise versus noise that really <laughs> ramped up recently. So, in th- that way, I kind of make them 1A, 1B in terms of kind of, kind of hard conversation. Um, you know, I, as when people listen to the Hunter episode, um, we, we talked, I think, around a lot of nuance, and that, that caused that episode to be a little bit on the longer side, but it's hard to have these conversations without kind of really digging in. A single tweet, 280 characters left, JC sucks, Hunter sucks, you know. <laughs> I'm looking for more nuanced conversation than that. I, I, I get it, I, especially during a game, something bad happens or, you know, whatever. It's, that's normal kind of fan reaction. But I'm looking forward to kind of digging in here and talking about um, his value, what he does well how he fits this team going forward and things like that. I think it should be an interesting conversation. I agree. And uh, it's for what it's worth, it's kind of funny to compare uh, John and DeAndre. We won't won't keep doing that, but they're they're basically the exact same age, which is always interesting to remember that Collins was here a lot earlier than DeAndre was. He's the longest tenured hawk, John Collins is, uh, by a lot, actually. Uh, But... Uh, he and DeAndre are the same age, and it's like you think of John Collins as almost being like he's like he's thirty or something. Like he's been it's part of that's the conversation and how long he's been on the trade market and all that stuff. But he's uh, he's just now going to be twenty six in September. He's still twenty five years old. So an interesting sort of comparison there. And I think the other part, and we talked about it a little bit with, with Hunter as well. So for 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 repeating it, but uh, the way that I would put it always is that you know John Collins is kind of proven to be a very good NBA player for several seasons, and there's nuance to that, of course but in a way that Hunter had not proven to be like uh, this. We're not far off from John Collins being on a lot of top 60, 70 player in the league lists a couple of years ago, that kind of thing. And um, that conversation is really interesting as well. So I do want to get into the offense, uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to throw a curveball. We're going to do the offense last. So make everybody else hang out for that. That's the, that's the part of the side of the floor. That's been the most controversial. I think for Johnson, we're going to hold off on that start with the defense, which is very uh, true for us. I think Glenn, um, I'll ask you this broadly before I dive into John, uh, was he their best defensive player this season that was not playing center? So basically, not Capella, not a Kong Wu. Was he their best defender otherwise? Because he might have might have been. I'm not sure he was, but he might have been. Yeah, he's certainly in contention for that status. Um, for me, it's, again, we have to kind of, when I think about his value defensively, the first, I don't know, somewhere between half to two-thirds of the regular season, he was absolutely critical. Like, all their, their best defensive lineups, their, their best defensive play, absolutely you know kind of necessitate him being on on the court right and there's uh, you know a few things to kind of dig in around that number one is his ability to organize for a four is 
exceptional. He's a great organizer, a great communicator. He's a really smart player. Um, and he just kind of gives you a lot there. And we'll recall that in the really all season long point of attack defense was their major issue on the end of the court. Clint having to help towards a, a ball handler that's gotten past the point of attack defense and having JC there to kind of be able to impact uh, help with, with help at the rim, all that sort of stuff. And not only that, but when Clint or Anyeka were kind of getting up to the level of the screen or needing to be early with their help towards the ball handler, JC keeping everybody kind of organized. You're here, you're here, you're low on this. You know, I'm going no, I'm going to step down here and become low and help here. You know, just a ton of that. And that's where a lot of his value uh, comes through on defense. The last third of the season, regular season, plus maybe a little more than that, the Hawks were really trying to not ask their big men to help as much. And they were yeah. challenging their guards and wings to be a little bit more stout at the point of attack. What's funny about that is that is one way. Now, I'm not saying that's the wrong goal to pursue, but that's one way to kind of dilute JC's value because JC is a guy who can kind of clean it up there. And if the idea is we don't want our bigs to have to clean up things at the rim so much, well, then the things that JC does best starts to get diluted and impact kind of what the value he brings on defense. Now, but we can talk about whether that should be the plan of kind of going forward, having suspect point of attack defense and having these guys at the back and kind of clean it all up. That's maybe okay in the regular season. If your goal is to be, maybe we could be a league average defense that way, you know, but once you get into the postseason, I mean, if you can't contain the ball, you have no shot, no matter how good, maybe the guy, the big man you have kind of behind all of that. So I think it feels like every time we kind of dig into an area of JC's play, it's going to be like scheme dependent, role dependent. What are you trying to do with your team? And there are, and there are things that the Hawks probably need to do that don't put John in the position regularly to use his uh, stronger skills. Today's show is brought to you by the good folks at eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure the right pl players are the perfect fits for your roster. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part has to fit just right. The next time you're looking for parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay's guaranteed fit, you can be sure every single part that you need happens to fit right and does so the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage, look for the green check, to know the part will be fitting for you or your money will be coming back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop with eBay Motors. With only 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game with no time wasted. After all, it's easy to bring home a win with the right parts are actually guaranteed for you. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices at ebaymotors.com. One more time, that is ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. To kind of build off what you just said, a lot of that discussion is going to happen on offense, and we'll talk about that too, but it's also true defensively. I wholeheartedly agree. It's uh, because, you know, part of that's the archetype, and there's this whole conversation that we can maybe have or maybe not that we've had a bunch with Andrew Kelly offline and our, our friends there. Like John Collins is not the archetypal modern day power forward. Most teams don't use a guy like John anymore. He's, you know, 15 years ago, it would have been a very traditional normal power forward to have. Um, he kind of missed that in some, in some respects, but that, that comes on defense too. Like, you know, and that's maybe a lot of theory that he could play small ball center. And that was kind of how he was drafted. And he kind of moved away from that because he showed so much more skill level and all these things. And, um, no one's saying he's going to be a, a great defensive anchor at the five, which is why he's not playing there. But it is, uh, it's kind of just what you're looking for. I was going to ask you, you know, kind of what he's good at and what he's not. Cause, you know, I want to try to at least isolate, you know, the player for now. Cause a lot of it is context related. And I, I totally agree with you on that. But like, you know, for instance, he's a really good secondary rim protector for a power forward, like really good. Um, part of that is that, again, he's played some center in his career as in college and all that stuff. And like, but he's, 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 got, he's gotten better there. And I think broadly, just to say it out loud for anyone who may not, I think there's this still out there. I'm sure you've seen it too, conception, maybe more nationally than locally, but it's still out there. Like people still think of John as this like negative defender and it, it's just not the case anymore. It hasn't been the case yeah. for a while to be fair, right. but like, I think that's just, it's one of those things where defense in particular is kind of sticky in good ways and bad ways. It's happened with uh, guys who were good early in the career. They've gotten worse as they got older once a narrative sets in, especially nationally, for people that don't watch every Hawks game, uh, you know, Collins used to be a bad defender. It's true. When he first came in the league, that was a huge concern. And now it, it is not. In fact, he was, I think he's pretty good. Uh, uh, at times, really good defensively. Um, but just for the listeners, 
what do you think of his like strengths and weaknesses defensively, both like in the team context that they're playing in, and also just like if, if you throw him around the league somewhere else, like what can he be trusted to, go, to be good at, and where does he kind of struggle? Yeah, so we kind of covered the weak side help, right? And yeah, we, we hit on that. Um, we've talked about his ability to organize from the four, which is really unusual, right? Uh, there aren't a lot of uh, guys um, that can are comfortable kind of doing that um, from that position. Uh, for me, it, it the next thing to kind of highlight is his team defense. You know, he's just always in the right place, always doing the right thing, knows where he's supposed to be, talking, communicating all the time, uh, hustles back uh, to c- catch rim runners, organizes them in transition defense, making sure it's clear, you know, like who's got the ball, who's kind of got the rim, things like that. And, and I know that um, fans who just want to watch an NBA game just to enjoy watching the game don't necessarily want to even kind of, you know, get that in depth in terms of their how they're watching the game. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I think it is harder to kind of tease out his value without kind of getting into things that maybe coaches or, you know, really – uh, fans that are that really want to watch kind of scheme and you know and kind of you know team execution and individual execution and things like that. And the next thing I would say is, you know, I think the average NBA observer don't realize how much he's improved kind of defending on ball. You know, mm-hmm. now that's not to say I want to go see him like you know guarding you know, Paul George or you know whatever you know. He's had to at times though. They've made him do it at times. <laughs> he, he has, and and yeah. he doesn't embarrass himself you know kind of in that sense but getting switched on the ball handlers he's better than you think right uh is he a guy is he the kind of guy that makes you say we want to do that all the time no he's not at that level right but in a if you're switching one through four or one through five you could put him on the court and feel like that he could do well enough yeah. for me to to feel like he can he can do that um Again, I mean, against the best, you know, individual, you know, creators, shot creators, uh, offensive creators, he, he's going to get beat sometimes, you know. So he, he's not an all, you know, defense level player a, at all. But when it co- but NBA coaches, I still think, value team defense, communications, uh, connectivity a lot higher than maybe a lot of NBA fans realize. And he's uh, about as good as it gets in those areas, you know. The one thing I would um, kind of point out to where maybe he's not as good as a reputation he, um, as a defensive rebounder, you know, he's not uh, quite as good as maybe it seems. You know, I think that mostly shows up when he's at the five playing against a, a big, you know, yeah, he, can, he can't anchor there. Yeah, he's a supporting but, rebounder, right? But as a power forward, you, I think a lot of people might think like, oh, he's like a top tier rebounder. His rebounding prowess really shows up more in the offensive glass. He's more elite, kind of on that end. Um, but but still, he he boxes out. He's not he's not a very big, strong body. He's more bouncy and uh, you know fast and, and those sorts of things. And so and that sort of teases it out too. So for me, it's it's all the stuff that NBA coaches really value: connectivity, communication, structure, uh, working uh, as a good team defender, and then in individual play. I think he just kind of surprises you sometimes with how well he can contain. You know, he spent some time on Jason Tatum in that Boston uh, series. He had you know, a number of possessions there. And when they couldn't have Hunter on the court for them, there were times that Quinn swung JC over there. And did he, like, lock him up? No. But that's the standard on uh, Twitter conversations, did you lock him up or not? <laughs> but but he can give you some credible reps in, you know, as small as volumes around that that I think is better than what most people might recognize. <laughs> Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make a fast break to FanDuel right now to bet on all the sporting action that you're looking for. And right now, FanDuel customers can get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's $2,500 in bonus bets if your first bet does not win at FanDuel. They have great promotions this time of year and really each and every day. You get paid instantly when you win at FanDuel, and the app is safe and secure. They have every kind of betting bidding angle that you're looking for that you might be see- seeking this time of year as well. They cover the whole range of sports, including the NBA, of course, and WNBA, football, baseball, golf, tennis, soccer, auto racing, Etc. Etc. And FanDuel also has different wagering options for you. They have the live betting options. They have single game parlays, futures, player props, point spreads, totals, and money lines. Anything you're looking for, they have it at FanDuel. There's no better place to bet in the basketball space or any really any anywhere in the sporting space. And America's number one sports book, and that is FanDuel. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Get that no sweat first bet to $2,500. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel is the official sports betting partner of the NBA. 
Yeah, I agree with you on the on the point about him not being the biggest guy. Like he's got power forward size and really honestly above average size for a modern power forward. But he's not he's not huge. He never has been huge. I think he's like six nine, maybe six ten on a good day. And he's slimmed down. If you look at if you look at him early in his career at Wake Forest, he's he's a lot. I think he made a conscious choice to go slimmer, to go more bouncy, and it, it's worked for him obviously. But he's not a banger in that way. Like he's still more physical than a lot of fours are. But um, that does kind of lead itself. And even on the glass, you know, it's it's important to point this out. Actually, um, you know, his rebound numbers have waxed and waned a little bit. This year was, a, I think, maybe even a career low. Um, yep. Part of that's role-based. I mean, he's playing more on the perimeter than he ever has. Um, and it's uh, somebody asked me this the other day, and I forgot to address it. Um, it is at least worth acknowledging for players like Hunter, who, for instance, who I think has proven to be a pretty bad rebounder. Playing next to Clint hurts everybody's rebounding, and that is that's important context as far as like, individual numbers are concerned. That's the case with John too, but I agree, and uh, he he has gotten better. And I think we saw at times, in the, especially in the playoffs, they were they were putting him on Tatum. They weren't terribly worried about that. Like he was that wasn't their primary assignment necessarily all the time, but like he can do it in a way that honestly would have shocked me when they drafted John Collins. Him holding up against a good wing player would have been a shock to me. You know what I mean? Like that is yeah. not what I thought saw uh, saw coming. Uh, it's been a journey on that end of the floor. But I always want to just emphasize, you know, broadly speaking, even like he's a pretty good defender to pretty. I mean, even the numbers, uh, you know, the, the more advanced numbers, your EPMs, they all kind of see him as like an average to above average defender. And that's I think that's fair. He's not he's not going to change your life defensively. He's not Draymond Green. But if people are still holding on to this to this thought process that he's this like damaging defensive player, it's just it's just not the case. The the the, the front court's not really been the issue defensively the last uh, couple of years. He's he's not he's not the problem. You can certainly argue he's not he's not going to change you again. Um, unilaterally defensively, like Jalen Johnson's defensive upside is a lot higher than John Collins. Yep. I'll certainly acknowledge that. But as far as like w- right now today, defense, you know, defense at the fourth, it's not really been an issue with, with John on the court. Yeah. And I think you have to add in too that he plays hard all the time. The effort is always, always a huge thing, for right? Him. Yep. And you can look at him like you'll be in the third quarter and he's got three or four shots and it doesn't impact his defensive intensity and engagement and effort at all. And so a lot of what he does on defense too, kind of in those non-stat areas, if you will, is just good teammate, plays hard, you know, kind of gives it all, doesn't sulk when things aren't swinging his way on offense. Um, and again, from a kind of a coach's perspective, that's the kind of thing that you want, you know. Um, so it, never going to be, you know, probably, I, I don't know if we kind of we kind of do this, but Never going to be ever kind of someone you think of like a top 50 defender in the league. Yeah. Unless you're talking to a coach and like, no, I want the connectivity. <laughs> I want the team. I want the yeah. hell. I want the, you know, all that sort of stuff. And an NBA coach might be like, no, no, I would put him in that maybe top 60 or something, something along those lines. Um, but, it, you know, just like it is an offense, which we'll talk about, a lot of it does come down to what scheme are you running? What can you do? He, he will do whatever you ask. He will try to do whatever you ask. And I think there's no question around that. But to get the most out of him and to set him up to be the most impactful defender does really come down to: Are you going to switch a lot? He works. He brings more value in a switching defense. Are you going to get your five up the floor? He provides more value there. If you're going to, you know, play a, a Brook Lopez style kind of drop five, he has less opportunity to kind of use his best skill set. And you know, going back to kind of his size. I, you probably see it too, like on Twitter when he's getting pushed around by a bigger guy, or whatever. Like, oh, he needs to hit the weight room, and I, I just want to shoot that down. You know, John's <laughs> John's value is kind of built around his ability to run and jump, and in my mind, you don't go do something with your body that's going to detract from your elite areas of play, your elite areas of skill. Uh, and if he were to run and jump the same way, which we know he would do, like you've said before, I've heard you say before, even in the preseason, he's ridiculous. Like he does this unnecessary. It's scary. Like he, uh, uh, he, he, he plays too hard. And I mean, I saw that up close and personal this year in, in Birmingham. I thought, yeah. I thought it was like, he's, it's a, it's a fourth quarter of a meaningless game. And he's still like doing these flying. I'm like, dude, John, just don't, you don't need to do that yeah. right now, but he, he can't turn it off. But could you imagine him putting on like 15 pounds and running? I mean, he would his his likelihood of injury would go way up like that yeah. kind of wear and tear with extra weight on his knees or you know whatever it is, and and on top of that it, it would probably dilute his ability to kind of run and jump. So for me, it's like let's stop trying to make these players something that they're not. Let's, not, let's stop trying to steer them away from 
um, kind of being uh, built for um, their their game in a way that you know John uses the running, jumping, sprinting, all that sort of stuff. And for and, and when he's getting pushed around, it's technique. It's getting being there early. It's, it's establishing position before the other guy does, and he knows that, and he does it a good bit. You know, it's hard sometimes when the point of attack, that the point of attack defense is struggling so much. It's hard to kind of you know not help towards that or whatever. So you know the Hawks team defense kind of makes it a little bit hard. But you know, if you were to ask me to kind of rank him like where he is, I'm like. It really comes down to like what, what do you value? Do you want a stopper? It's like I stop being a you know, he's never going to be an individual stopper, but having a guy like him who can do all of those structure and connectivity stuff on the back end, whether that's transition defense, half court defense, whether you're switching nuts or getting big up the floor or whatever, he he's just really smart, reads the floor really well on defense, communicates really really well, and I know that that's not areas that excites, you know, every NBA fan, but it really has a lot of value. And that has to be kind of kind of thought of. The Hawks fans to me, you know, we heard all season long, they gotta trade JC, they gotta trade JC. And this what it wasn't necessarily brand new this season. And and all I said was like, especially if you just the hypothetical like, oh, let's trade him for Q's. Like man, I you throw that out there, like I don't think you understand like like how fragile any good stretch of defensive play from this team is and how if you detract, remove, trade away one of their better defenders, one of their best defenders, maybe their best defender uh, that, that was at a center uh, this year, like, good luck, you know. And so – and then, well, well like, that doesn't work the contract. That's a different conversation, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, but he is absolutely been critical to – a critical part of their best defensive lineups for a couple of years now. And, and that hasn't changed uh, in the, in the, um, uh, in, in the postseason, like in that Celtic series, he was a plus 5.1, I think, even though the offense was atrocious with him on. Um, I think on offense in the series, they were like minus 17 on defense. They were 22 points better, maybe 20, almost 23 points better with him on defense. Part of that was like when he was off, Bay was on, and Bay was terrible on defense in that series. Um, yeah, but it, I mean, was, it was twenty three points. It was one hundred and seven with him on and one thirty with him off, which is just yeah. that's it's again, it's a small sample size, and that is comical. Like twenty three right. points, this is crazy. But 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 when you watch the series, you could see they were just I use the word a lot more solid in what they were doing with JC on there. And part of that is experience. He's a veteran now. But he really does work really hard mentally and work really hard physically. He does the best he can on basically every possession. And that goes a long, long way. You know, are you going to go into a series like we want John Collins to defend Jason Tatum for 12 minutes a game? No, that's not the plan that you want. But if you're like, we're, we we got to switch with this lineup with JC on, we have a much better chance of being successful doing that. And so, so much of his value really comes, comes down to his versatility. And if you're going to do things schematically on one end or the other, that kind of erodes from his ability to leverage his versatility, he's going to have a harder time making the contribution that you, that you want, especially if you consider the contract. It's going to be even harder for him to kind of measure up in terms of the kind of contribution you're looking for. But from a coaching standpoint and a team-mindedness standpoint, he's kind of a dream player uh, in, in, that, in that sense for me. All right, that's it for part one with myself and Glenn talking about John Collins. And as, as, as a reminder, part two should be available for you right now in your podcast feed of choice. So please click on over to that discussion. It's a lot of fun to talk about basketball with Glenn anywhere and about anything. But please subscribe to this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, etc. Follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Hawks. Follow me on Twitter at BT Roland. Follow my written work on the Patreon side, patreon.com slash BT Roland. Thank you again for listening, everybody. And we'll see you all next time.